Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at a Teleview 60, a 60mm f6 Apple refractor, the baby in the Teleview lineup. You know, some companies in our hobby are known better for their designers than they are for the products themselves. Who can think about astrophysics, for example, without thinking about Roland? You know, Dave Kriege and Obsession, Rick Singmaster and Starmaster Telescopes, Thomas Back and others. But you know, no company in our hobby is so closely allied in our minds with its designer as is Teleview with Al Nagler. Al is Teleview and vice versa. You can feel his personality in every one of his products that you pick up. Teleview eyepieces are the standard by which all others are judged. With only very minor exceptions, Teleview eyepieces are the only ones that I ever use. And you know, despite the technical and engineering excellence that goes into Teleview products, when you hang out with Al Nagler, you get the sense that all he really wants you to do is have fun. So if Teleview products facilitate you having fun, I think that makes him happy. Teleview products are not cheap, but they are keepers. You buy it once, you never have to worry about it again. And if for some reason you don't want your Teleview product, there will always be somebody lining up to buy it from you. I first did a review of this product when it came out in 2004 on Scope Reviews, and I'll link that below. Has it really been that long? <laughs> Felt like it was only a few years ago. But anyway, it was around $800 back then. Expensive for a 60 millimeter refractor, but even today at the time of filming, it's just under $900. So figuring in inflation from 2004, it's really not bad. Okay, so here we are with the Teleview 60. And you know, this thing is so tiny, you almost have to do this in close up. I mean, it's almost not even there. But this is the optical tube, and it uses what may be. Uh, the same part actually is the old Teleview Ranger for the focuser. So if you haven't seen the, the Ranger focuser, this knob here is your fine, is your coarse focus here. So let's say you want to be somewhere here. And then this is a helical focuser. So you do this, I don't know if you can see this, the draw tube is actually moving out. Some people have mixed feelings about this helical focuser. It's never really bothered me. Seems like it's okay. But anyhow, this Dew shield does come out. There is a dew cap, and you can see nice deep dark coatings inside and little micro baffles here. So, this screw here is for your balance. If you want to put this on some sort of a mount, you can balance back and forth. And of course, I've just ruined my balance point. I had this thing pretty precisely balanced for my rig. I'm going to have to redo that. So, on the bottom, you have some drilled, take care of this here, get some drilled holes here uh, for various mounting systems. These outer ones, I believe, are the ones for a standard Teleview cradle mounting system. So if you have any of Teleview's mounts, which I assume they want you to use if you buy one of these, panoramic, Gibraltar, upswing, telepod, doesn't matter, they will all fit this hole spacing. So again, I do have to stress that for beginners, I mean, this is all you get. <laughs> uh, I think the seasoned astronomers out there are comfortable with this idea of this sort of a la carte type of situation, but uh, beginners need to understand uh, all of the rest of this is on you. You're just getting the optical tube. This does come with a drawstring bag. It has gone missing on this particular sample for whatever reason, but you get the bag, you get the optical tube, and of course the all important uh, manual with the Al Nagler signature on it. So, you know, if you do want to get a case that's better than the drawstring case that comes with it, they do make a fitted case, and this is actually quite nice. It's die-cut foam inside where you can put the optical tube, a diagonal, and a couple of eyepieces. This is about $100. I strongly recommend this. It uh, keeps everything nice and tidy. And there's an undeniable cool factor in having this thing in the case and carrying it around. So again, if you are going to outfit this thing, I'll show you what this looks like. Take the dust cap off, extend the dew shield, pull this out to a position like this. Take this off. Let's we'll stick with the Teleview theme with the diagonal. This is a Teleview inch and a quarter Everbright dielectric diagonal. A really nice piece of equipment there, one of my favorite diagonals of all time. And for an eyepiece, I think I'm going to try to go with a 13 millimeter Type 6 Nagler. Uh, only yielding 
28 power or so. That's normally a planetary eyepiece in most telescopes. And for higher power, or relatively speaking, I've got an original 7 millimeter Nagler here. That's going to be, you know, 50 or 60 power or so. If you want to look at planets or the moon or double stars, you're probably going to have to make the acquaintance of a Barlow lens. So mainly I think for low power viewing this telescope, but you can go higher if you desire. So when you're done, I'll show you how this goes together like this. We've got everything put together and you can bring the case in like this. It goes in the case like so. And put an eyepiece here, the diagonal. The whole thing zips up and off you go. Nice little package. So here we are at one of my favorite observing sites with the Teleview 60. It's on my Teleview telepod and an old Bogan 3001 tripod. It's supposed to be really clear tonight, so I'm gonna come back here and I wanted to run an experiment. I mean, this is such a simple rig. It's a scope and a 13 millimeter Nagler and that's it. I wanted to see if I would be happy just using this telescope all night long for an observing session. Will I be able to see everything that I want to see? Will I run out? How much fun will I have? I'm just going to bring one scope, one eyepiece tonight, and let's see what happens. Okay, so how was it? Well, pretty good actually. The optics, nothing really to talk about here. Spherical aberration, chromatic aberration, astigmatism. I didn't really see anything. Again, when you don't have much to talk about with the optics, it's usually a good sign. So one thing that is sometimes said about the scope with the lack of a provision for a conventional finder is that it acts like its own finder at low power. Some people are okay with this. I am sort of okay with it. I do like a traditional finder of some kind. So what I've done in the past is what I did that, that night is I took this, I've shown this before, it's a Rigel quick finder and it's on an elastic band and you throw it on the scope like this and you can use it as a finder it projects a red bullseye at infinity. So as far as things to look at, I saw a number of objects, rather than try to rattle them off here and forget something, I'll throw up this graphic of things that I saw. And it took me, I don't know, about 40 or 45 minutes to see all this stuff. That may sound like I'm working pretty fast, but keep in mind with this scope, uh, there's no setup time. I don't have to set up an equatorial mount. I don't have to attach a battery. There is no go-to system to initialize and the setup and the breakdown time for a go-to mount alone is going to be, you know, 15 to 20 minutes, you know, total just packing and unpacking. With this scope, I just walked out of the car and I was observing in less than two minutes. So among these objects, you know, there's 18 or 20 of those things up there. Among the stuff that I struck out on, I think it is because those objects are quite small. And if I had more magnification, I have a feeling I would have gotten those, but all I had was this 13 millimeter Nagler type six. So I'll point out a couple of things that I saw that were really good. First of all, those showpiece objects, the Pleiades, the Andromeda Galaxy, and the Orion Nebula, the double cluster. Yeah, I know they're showpiece objects and everybody looks at them, but there's a reason everybody looks at them. They just look fantastic. And really the Pleiades in particular just look like those, you know, diamonds on velvet, bright pinpoint objects against an inky black sky. It's what refractors do best. I will point out a couple of objects that I thought were interesting that I saw. One of them was M33. I expected to strike out on that one. It's a low contrast dim object, but I saw it. It was a hazy smudge in the eyepiece. It didn't look great, of course, because it's only 60 millimeters, but I was surprised I was able to get that one. It's sinking towards the west. The other one, also kind of low on the horizon and rising in the north, were M81 and M82, the galaxies in Ursa Major. Those were easily seen as a pair of eyebrows or whiskers hanging out in space. So did I wish for more aperture? Of course I did. After a while, I started to run out of things to look at. If I'd had a larger scope nearby, I think I probably could have gone between the two of them and the two would have played off each other quite well. 
So I also did this. I took the telescope off of the Teleview telepod, took off the mounting studs, and used a Vixen compatible plate. That's this red thing you see here. Two quarter inch by 20 screws. This is an easy conversion if you have the plate and put it on my CG5 GoTo mount. Now I have the full benefit of tracking and GoTo capability. Works quite well in this configuration. As you can see, it needs almost no counterweight at all to balance the thing. I also took the opportunity to use this. This is my planetary imager, stuck it in the focuser draw tube, and got these images of the moon. So the Teleview 60's most obvious competitor here is the Takahashi FS60. By the way, interesting to note the different design philosophies taken by the two different companies for what is essentially the same telescope. These are 60 millimeter F6 refractors. This one's an F5.9, but you get the idea. They're pretty much the same. Takahashi taking the more traditional approach, non-tapered tube, but you can put traditional tube rings on, finder, rack and pinion focuser, Teleview taking a different approach. So keep in mind, the optical tubes cost about the same. The base model for the FS60 is around $900, but if you're gonna start adding some of this stuff on here, keep in mind Takahashi accessories are not cheap. The price of this rig can balloon really fast on you if you're not careful. Some people are gonna say they like the rack and pinion focuser better than the helical focuser, but do keep in mind that the focus travel on this particular model is quite small. You may not be able to get it to reach focus for everything that you wanna do with it. So if you're trying to choose between these two, I would say whatever system you have bought into, you know, you might just want to stay in that particular system. If you haven't, you know, pick a camp and then stay with it. And of course, if you're well healed, well, there's nothing wrong with buying both of them. So there you have it, a look at the Teleview 60. So should this be your only telescope? Should it be your first telescope? Yeah, probably not. I think you need more aperture to get things done. But as a second telescope, a travel telescope, something to throw in your car, I don't know if you can do much better than this. So the Teleview 60 is the ultimate scope for the zombie apocalypse when it happens. You can throw it in your backpack when you're running away. You can spot the horde from a distance. It just may save your life. Think about it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.